Hey, how y'all doing? This is Mongo Slade. But before we get into the into AEW Dynamite, man, I want to talk about this internet thing. So I saw uh, some 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 very interesting tweets because I was live tweeting AEW Dynamite, which you shouldn't do, by the way. Don't try this at home. Anyway, I saw some 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 really crazy stuff. So this guy from What Culture basically decides to get on his knees and pray to the altar of Chris Jericho. He says, and I quote, Chris Jericho finding a storyline reason to give 19 year olds something while working a long term storyline with his 24 year old apprentice is a better developmental system than the performance center. Don't at me. I don't know what that any I don't know what any of that means. What does it mean for that to be a developmental system? It's just Chris Jericho working with young talents. That's that's all it is. It's just Chris Jericho working with young talents. Conversely, this is what some people who were watching the NBA game and then they saw AEW as the NBA game goes off the air. The first thing they see is Chris Jericho. So all of these young NBA fans, <laughs> here's what they have to say about Chris Jericho. And I quote, Jesus Christ, Chris Jericho looks fucking awful. LMAO, another guy. My man, Chris Jericho, got a beer belly. Another guy. Bro, Chris Jericho need to get out the ring. LOL, dude lost it. <laughs> Another guy. Chris Jericho is still wrestling? He ought to be Shane. And laughing emoji, laughing emoji. And what the F is AEW? Another guy. Chris Jericho fat as shit. Another guy, bruh, what is Chris Jericho doing on this bootleg AEW wrestling league, dot, 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 and why wrestlers' bodies fall off so bad? Laughing emoji, laughing emoji. I, I read it as he wrote it, okay? He wrote it in all caps. I screamed it. Another guy, Chris Jericho is, is, a, is a king in this knockoff WWE, huh? <laughs> Another guy, Celtics win and Jericho is fat. Good vibes only. Another guy, Chris Jericho, fat as hell, <laughs> laughing emoji. Another guy, Chris Jericho, looks awful. So there it is. What a wrestling journalist or a wrestling YouTuber thinks about Chris Jericho and what the average audience thinks about Chris Jericho in 2020. Yikes. That's a, that's a, that's a big box of yikes. That's that's yikes covered in chocolate and stuffed with mint. That's bad. Oh, oh, oh that's so bad. So that's what we started with when it comes to AEW Dynamite. We started with Chris Jericho, who was who not only did people on Twitter ream him for being fat and out of shape. But also, the internet reigns Chris Jericho because he did a concert with Steel Panther over the weekend where he, I guess, performed some songs or something to that effect. And people were so disappointed in Chris. And, of course, they reminded themselves that he was a Trump supporter and all that other stuff. And, well, Chris Jericho isn't one of their, isn't one of their favorite guys right now on the internet. But somebody still found a way to blow him. But we're not going to get into that. I was going to talk about that. But I, I decided not to. But the internet being mad at Chris Jericho for performing a show, it's like, so what, man? Look, we, we're, we're in December. People have been going through this stuff since, what, May? Uh, not even May. Probably through, no, nah, because it had to be. It was before WrestleMania, so it had to be February, March. Come on. people. You can't expect people to stay in the house forever. Just because you're a hermit stuck to the computer doesn't mean other people have to be the same as well. Jericho is 50, you know? Hopefully, half of his life has already been lived. He has to still have another 50 years, hopefully. Let him enjoy whatever, how many years he got left. Get the hell out of here. So we got Chris Jericho and MJF versus Top Flight. I actually noticed that the Judas chant was edited this time. I did notice it. Notice Usually when Brian last mentions it, you know, the Cornette podcast, he always talks about uh, the Judas being uh, edited. I usually did not notice those things. But I did notice it this time because there was like a heavy edit, a heavy cut right there in that piece. And um, 
that was it was so obvious that they ran it back a second time. So it was I I, I was OK. I was laughing at the Judas thing. And I started watching this match, and I, I'm not gonna be, not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie to you guys. I never lie, especially not stuff like this. This was like my least favorite episode of AEW Dynamite, probably ever. Now I'm usually hard on Dynamite, you know, but this was legitimately boring. Now I'm gonna tell you why, because I'm not just gonna say, "Oh, it's boring. I didn't like it." A lot of these matches were the same shit. It was just guys jumping around, and this was one of these matches because Top Flight basically the, the baby face shine was them doing choreographed wrestling holds where they basically was doing the same moves that they look back at each other to make sure that they're in sync as they do things like stereo moonsaults and stereo other attacks and it's like oh okay we have to make sure that these guys are in lockstep at all times before we can actually have a wrestling match go on here and you know but that was the baby face shine that was the early part of the match where you know they was able to show off what they can do which is, you know, the point of the baby face shine is to show off what they can do. But um, I don't see any difference between Top Flight, the Acclaim, the Young Bucks, or any of these other teams. I just don't see the difference. Like, for starters, you don't bring in so many people at one time because it does get confusing. Like, if I, don't, if I don't watch the show every week, I don't know the difference between Top Flight and the Acclaim. They're basically the same thing. They're, you know, four young guys. You know? And I get... <clears throat> I actually like that AEW put them in the ring with more experienced people. That was smart. Instead of having them wrestle each other, they put them in the ring with experienced people so that they can learn. But what good is it if in the in the in the acclaims place they wrestling the young bucks who just want to get their shit in? And in this situation, you have Chris Jericho who is just letting the kids do what they do, which is do flips and, and all that type of stuff. Not build character, not build a story, not build anything. Like this match was just guys jumping and then you know occasionally jericho will catch hold of one of them and they have to sell like that was that was pretty much it you know they got they got plenty of offense in um so did top flight they got plenty of offense in man but i was i was not interested uh mjf won with the heat seeker which again is a is a power driver like move um uh, what is like a it's like a draping power driver off the um off the second rope it's very interesting Actually, it's not a bad finish. Um, and then uh, after that, we got something that disa uh, disaster took place. Jake Hager stepped to the ring with a microphone. I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. And then, um, so, <clears throat> he starts talking about, you know, uh, he congratulated his guys on winning. Then he was angry that Wardlow wasn't there because Wardlow was off handling family business. I mean, it is two days before Christmas, right? Uh, and he says that the inner circle is his family. So he talks some more shit about Wardlow and how Wardlow has been pissing him off. And says that he's going to, he says that Wardlow is an asset, but he's also an asshole. And so he's going to fight him next week. So we're going to get heel versus heel, Hager versus Wardlow next week. I guess they're about to turn. Wardlow babyface. Interesting. Very, very interesting. I don't know if Wardlow is ready for to carry the sack of shit they call with Jake Hager around. I mean, I don't know how this benefits Wardlow. Uh, I guess if he wins, it's okay. But why would Jericho let them fight after just two weeks ago? They said that they were going to be good, that they were good. And I know I, I know I said that. It might be a better way to to deal with the problem by ha having them wrestle, like having Sammy Guevara wrestle MJF may be a good way to blow off the steam. And that was the right idea. Like, I'm not against w uh, Wardlow and Hager fighting. I'm against Wardlow and Hager fighting just two weeks after you said you weren't going to be fighting anymore. Y you already agreed that you're not going to be fighting anymore. And now two weeks later, you're going back on it. Like... <laughs> I don't, whatever. I don't, <laughs> nothing matters. None of this matters. Anyway, um, so we get the acclaimed. They do a rap video that they call Buck Hunt, where they talked about the, turning the young bucks into young boys and called them Meltzer ass kissers. This was bad. I, I, I'm really starting to hate the acclaimed. This is really bad. Uh, I, look, I'm a connoisseur of rap music. I used to be. I stopped listening to rap music in what, 
2016, 2015, maybe. I couldn't tell you the last, like, I think I listened to the last Nas album all the way through, because there was only, like, seven songs on it. But I don't listen to sit down and listen to rap albums anymore. I think I outgrew the genre. But these guys look like cartoon characters. They're dressed like, you know, rappers from, like, from three different generations. You got a boom box, like, it's 1980. You got uh, uh, headphones, like, it's, you know, 2020. You got a microphone. The rap style is, like, from the late 90s. It is, it's trash, man. It, like, it is over gimmicked, too. Like, that's another big problem is that people seem to forget that he, they're over gimmicked. The acclaimed. What I mean by that, they have boom boxes and headsets and microphones and gold chains. And they got this. It's just so much. They need to strip it down. If you're going to have them do a rap gimmick, both of them should be rappers or one of them should be a DJ. You know, like that should be like the way to get around it is maybe the other guy who doesn't rap. He does like the beats like he beatboxes or something, or at least he pretends to be a DJ or something to make him look different. Then pick a generation. Which generation of rap are you supposed to be representing here? Because the Fat Gold Ropes is from the 80s. The the Boombox is also from the 80s and in the early 90s. You know, so which which generation of rap are we looking at here? Because if you're going to have like an old school flavor, go full Run DMC. Go full, um, you know, LL Cool J. That would be dope. Like if you do it like a throwback rap thing because it's a simple style that they can mimic, that would be dope. You know, you could just have like the guys in like uh, in like jump Adidas jumpsuits with like the with the <laughs> with the chest out. You know, like you know like LL and the uh in the I'm Bad video or the Mama Said Knock You Out video. Like that'd have been cold. That'd have been dope. You know, because that at least would have been the aesthetic. But when you have this jumbled mess of numerous different generations just tossed together, along with we're rappers and we're rapidly rapping. It's like, no, man, this sucks. This sucks, man. <laughs> I really don't like the acclaimed. I really don't like them. Uh, I, to be quite honest, they they they, they gonna have to work really hard to win me over. I'm not against them. Like I'm not fast forwarding against you know, but I didn't like this. And for and I don't think it's also quite weird that uh, again, just imagine if it was Stanford. That, I'm going to say that quite. I'm just going to say that instead of saying if it was in WWE, people would. I'm just going to say, imagine if it was Stanford. Imagine if it was Stanford. that was making young guys do rap gimmicks. Young guys of color, by the way. Whatever. Not going to go through that. So we get to Sting Tony Schiavone segment. Right. So we're, we're supposed to figure out why Sting is here. Why is Sting coming to AEW? What do Sting? What does Sting want? So Sting comes back and he says that the question is too deep. He has to go back in time to when he was a young pup, not really knowing that much about the business. And he was looking for his big break. And then he did this fantastic Dusty Rose impression. I dare not even attempt, attempt to imitate his Dusty Rose impression. It was that good. It was too good for me to, to mess with. And he says that it was Dusty's idea to give him some color. To put color in his boots. Color is in his trunks. Color is in his face. And he saw Dusty's son, Cody, you know, rebuilding this jungle that he calls, you know, with TNT. And he wanted to be a part of it. And then here comes Taz, right? So then Taz comes out. Taz says Sting is selfish and that, you know, his whole career has been Shivani screaming, It's Sting! It's Sting! And then, so Stark says that, you know, that Sting gonna get hurt playing around in this jungle. I, I like Starks. I like him. He, he looks more and more like The Rock, but I like him. I like him. So Taz and his boys, you know, they basically get tired of Sting. They decide they're gonna beat him up. So they decide to come to the ring. The lights go out because the lights go out every week in AEW. And then there is Darby Allen in the ring with his skateboard. Sting has a baseball bat. Darby Allen has a skateboard. So the two massive walls of muscle that they call Powerhouse Hobbs and Brian Cage get backed down by a four foot dwarf with a skateboard and an old man with a baseball bat. OK. <laughs> OK. Whatever you say, Brody, if you say so, bro, it is what it is, man. 
It is what it is. Look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, look, as stupid as it is, I'm not going to rip them to shreds for this. The reason why, because you don't want to give anything away. I will rip them to shreds for, again, teasing Sting is going to say something, Sting is going to do something, and Sting does nothing. Like, I, I've, I, I can't imagine. Imagine if it was Stanford. Imagine. Just imagine if they teased you three weeks in a row on something that they didn't deliver on. What, 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 what kind of tweets would you be reading? What kind of things be popping up on these wrestling websites? Compare it to all of the, I can't believe Sting and Darby Allen are in the same ring. Oh, I feel goosebumps. I got goosebumps on my goosebumps on the back of my neck. I'm like, get the fuck out of here, Mark. So it, it, it was set up that uh, Darby Allen will be facing Brian Cage on January the 6th for the TNT Championship. But Powerhouse Hobbs said, no, 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 let's do it right now. I want to do it right now. And Taz was like, nah, man, chill. Like, what the hell is wrong with you? You got, you got a chemical imbalance or something? Why you want to fight so bad? <laughs> he didn't say that. It would have been funny if he just said that. He's just like, no, 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 no. We're not going to do that. So then we get something that was actually good. MJF approaches Santana. He's heard that Santana has lost somebody, somebody important to him, some important family. And then he says, you know, very contritely, you know, I just lost my granddad, you know, so I understand, you know, I just want to say, hey, look, um, um, you know, we, we in this together now. I'm here for you, dog. And they shake hands. They dap up. You know, he shakes hands with Ortiz and, you know, but before that, he told the cameraman, look, you know. I'm we're not I'm not doing this because you're here, you know, you know kind of kind of let people know that there is something still kind of off kilter about this whole thing. He acknowledged that the cameras were there. But I like this. I like that MJF is still trying to ingratiate himself to the various members of the inner circle who don't like him. You know, so he's still trying to win these guys over. It's not like he just got Jericho and now he's being snotty because Jericho's the leader and Jericho makes all the decisions. He's also still kind of, you know, brown nosing with everybody else. And this actually felt human. It actually felt real. It felt legit. It's, I mean, it's really going to feel it's going to feel good when he eventually either usurps the inner circle, which is what I want. I want him to take over the inner circle and Chris, kick Chris Jericho out like that would be great to me. That would be the best way to twist this story is not to MJF turns on the inner circle. And now you have like six baby faces now. Is that you kick Jericho out. Jericho is the one that has to leave. And then basically now the M now MJF is taking over. I would like that. I would think that would be pretty cool. But um the next match was not cool. It was the Jurassic Express, which is Marco Stunt, Luchasaurus, and Jungle Boy versus three members of the Dark Order, two of whom were wearing masks, so I don't have any idea who they were, and Colt Cabana. Um this match was it was it's Jurassic Express. So what do you think? The guy's jumping around. <laughs> That's really what it was. Jungle Boy jumping around. Marco Stunt jumping around. Luchasaurus using both of them as weapons. I just wrote down who cares. I did like the finish, though. The Jurassic Express is finished, which was kind of like a wheelbarrow into a powerbomb. Well, basically, Jungle Boy just had to catch him and bring him down safely. It wasn't too bad. Uh, I like the finish, but I don't. I didn't care about this match. This match had no heat. Because it's like, what's the heat between Jurassic Express and Dark Order? And uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it later. We'll get to it later when we talk about the Dark Order. So Tully interrupted because Marco Stunt was about to talk. And I have no idea why Marco Stunt was about to talk. I have no idea. Tully interfered, said the tag team of the year is FTR. And that they're the best there is. And he called <laughs> Jurassic Express Jurassic Park. And say that no dinosaurs are going to stop them. Apparently, they will fight. It will be FTR versus Jurassic Express on January the 6th. Okay, not too bad. You have uh, both um, AEW and NXT loading up this show. So then we get a segment where Kenny Omega is talking. Um, and But this is what pissed me off. is they, they were in like a hotel lobby or something. And everyone's wearing a mask. And Marvez is trying to ask questions through this mask. And... Don Callis is talking through the mask, and Kenny Omega is talking through the mask. I just for the first few seconds, just whoop, 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 whoop. I'm like, come the fuck on, really? Come on, bro. 
You can't move. You're on TV. Like I know it's you watch the news and there's idiots and masks on the news because like this is the new this is virtue signaling. That's and I'm sorry if you're like a new listener and you're like, well, but masks are safe. It's like you don't need to talk with a fucking mask on. Just don't. You know, like come on, that's stupid. <laughs> like it's it's stupid. If you feel like you have to have an interview, go somewhere where you can take your mask off. I mean, it's 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 dumb to to yell into a microphone with your voice half muffled. Anyway, Don Callis took his mask off. Uh, then he says that he's he's concerned that wrestlers are making decisions. That he's never seen this in thirty years in the wrestling business. He's never seen wrestlers be able to make their own matches, and this is ridiculous. And that Tony Khan needs to get it together. I do like that he's harping on this, though, because it's been a thing for a while that people have said, you know, wrestlers challenging other wrestlers to matches without some type of authority figure being there to to, to give the thumbs up. You know, they kind of don't like that. And it's just been something that has been going on in wrestling for a long time now. ECW used to do it. WWE does it way too much. WCW does it like these impromptu matches where it's got like, how about you fight me right now? And then the guy's like, all right, I'll fight you right now. Give me a referee out here. And then the referee just comes running down like this is official. Like, you need contract signings for some matches. For other matches, you just need to say, I'll fight you right now. Okay, I'll fight you right now. And then y'all fight. You know, like, what the fuck is the point of the contract? If we just gonna, <laughs> if that's all it takes, just say, I'll fight you right now. I'll fight you right now. And then that's it. You know, but, so I, I, I like that he kind of harped on that. You know, it was like, uh, you know, making a big deal out of it. Now, Kenny Omega. This was the best Kenny Omega promo in a long time. Uh, yes, I am going to give Kenny Omega credit for being a good promo here. Because he, he talked about Phoenix specifically. He said Phoenix is a choker. You know, Phoenix, you know, World Tag Team Championships, Phoenix couldn't beat him. Triple A Phoenix couldn't beat him. You know, Phoenix got himself hurt in the tournament, so he didn't get a chance to wrestle him. They said he was a choker. He's a choker. Every chance he gets, he's going to choke. And then he says that, you know, maybe we'll send him, maybe after I beat him, we'll send him to Impact. And then Don Callis says, well, no, he's a little injury prone. <laughs> but maybe we could call Conan and Triple A will take him. <laughs> Ooh, buddy. I like that. That was a sick burn. That was a good burn. And this was an even better burn. Kenny Omega says that, Phoenix is injury prone. He says, Phoenix, you get hurt. We get titles. I like that. I like that. Because it's playing off of how Phoenix constantly hurts himself in the ring and being reckless. I like Phoenix. I really do. But in, in the, he's good in Mexico. He is not good in the United States. I don't know what it is. I don't know. Maybe it's the crowd. Maybe it's his timing. Maybe it's you know, his comfort. I don't know. But you watch um, Phoenix in Mexico, he's really good. He's one of the best. You watch him in the United States, he's just like, I don't know, like a lazy. <laughs> he tries. I guess he tries really hard, but it's not it's not working out for him. His American run is not working out for him at all. So then we get another match that I don't care about. The Butcher versus Pac. And Eddie Kingston was on uh, commentary, which was actually a good idea. You know, him and Tony Schiavone have... Very good um, chemistry as far as bouncing bouncing off of each other. Um, the Butcher was wearing a wrestling gear, which was very awkward. Like, it was very weird to see him in wrestling gear. Instead of just, like, wearing gimmick clothes. Like, you would think if he was a Butcher, he would kind of just stay in gimmick clothes. But now he's, like, wrestling in wrestling gear. Uh, this, this is the part of the match. I, I, I don't care about this match at all. I don't think anybody does. Uh, but for, like, two minutes... It seemed like the butcher just malfunctioned. Like he was a robot that broke down. Like he's just holding Pac by the head. And Eddie Kingston is yelling, Butch, Butch, finish the job. Finish the job, Butch. Just just go ahead, Butch. Finish the job, man. Just finish him, Butch, 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 Butch. And Butcher's just holding this guy by the head, looking at Eddie Kingston, like, huh? What's what's going on, man? Like, what, what are you talking about? And this went on for far too long. It went on for far too long. Now, I'll tell you why it went so long. Because somebody probably missed their cue. Because as soon as Eddie Kingston comes from around the commentary booth, here comes Lance Archer to back him down. Now, 
you know, the butcher is distracted by Lance Archer coming. He first he was distracted by Eddie Kingston yelling at him. Now he's distracted by Lance Archer uh, coming out to back down Eddie Kingston. Of course, Pac wins with the Black Arrow, and I'm just thinking to myself, like, oh, could you imagine how dumb you have to be to 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 be winning a match? I I hate the distraction finish. I really do. Like, we need to just strip the distraction finish out of wrestling. Like, if we can just get it where there is no distraction finishes, or at least if they already really matter, like, why are we protecting the fucking butcher? Just let the guy get beat. Just let him get beat. Why do we have to, why do we have to, butch, butch, butch. It's like, get the fuck out of here, dog. Get out of here, bro. Okay, so. Uh, that sucked. I, I I didn't like any of these matches, dog. I'm not even gonna hold you up. All right, so <clears throat> Jay Jay Cargill, as the only member of this storyline that actually remembers that the storyline existed, Jay Cargill comes out and says that I guess that she admitted that she's a mother too. I believe she said she was a mom too, but she says something about oh, you know, Brandy. Congratulations to Brandy. But it's real convenient that she gets pregnant when some competition shows up, and she says like I challenge you. Shaq challenged Cody, but since you went up and got pregnant, you better have some real good competition for me. You know, somebody that's worth my time. And I questioned, I said, when did Shaq challenge Cody? That When Shaq did that sit down, he didn't challenge Cody. He didn't say, I want to fight Cody Rhodes. Yeah, I think I'll fight Cody Rhodes. I think I beat up Cody Rhodes. I don't remember that. I don't remember that at all. And then what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to, how are we going to pay this off? You have to wait at least almost a year for Brandy to drop that baby and get back into shape. And then she's also got to do some mothering. So you're talking about <laughs> over a year. This storyline is done. You should have just dropped it. Okay. So what they're probably going to end up doing is replacing Brandy with Red Velvet. That's what they're going to do. They're just going to say, okay, well, instead of you fighting Brandy, you're going to fight Red Velvet. Okay, fine. But she was going to fight Red Velvet anyway. So it didn't I mean because it was when you when you when you're beefing with the with the with the mentor, you also get the pupil. So you were going to beef with Red Velvet anyway. So what this means now is probably Red Velvet is going to be the, the centerpiece of the feud, which is better because I, I like Red Velvet. Like I said, she's cute. She's real cute. But uh, Jake Cargill, man, not good at talking. Not she's a little stilted. But um, she she has a little bit of confidence, but um, even in that pre tape promo, which it obviously was pre taped, I was just kind of like, hmm, we could have just quietly dropped it, and then she could have just said, "I'll get you when you, you know, when you drop that seed, I'm gonna catch you," you know. But but you know, or you know, just because you're pregnant, Cody ain't pregnant, we gonna get him, you know. And then maybe you bring somebody in. I guess if it has to be Shaq, it has to be somebody to attack Cody. Um, but it didn't happen. So I was just like, I, don't, I guess they haven't figured out how they is going to fix this problem yet. You know, you just, you could have just had them stand in the ring and then had Jade say, okay, you pregnant. All right. I respect that. I respect parenthood. I'm a parent myself or whatever. I'm going to let it slide this time. I'm going to get you. I want you to get back into shape, drop that seed, love that baby. Cause you know. In a year and a half, or whatever it's going to take, I'm going to put my foot in your ass. But first, pick somebody for me to fight. You know, since you can't fight, you pick somebody for me to fight. And then that would have been that would have been fine for me, you know. Because we obviously know that the pregnant woman can't wrestle. So, here we get another segment. We get uh, Miro, Kip, and Penelope. Penelope, I'm sorry. They're going to announce their wedding date. So, they're talking... And then boom, 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 best friends. And we think like, oh God, best friends are about to show up. And then, oh, it was a rib. It was a rib on the fans. The best friends aren't really coming because apparently somebody already beat up Trent. And Trent's being loaded into the ambulance with his shoulder in a sling, like, oh, oh. And, you know, Chuck Taylor is, I guess if you want to call it selling. He's selling and he's like, what's happening? What's going on? They took out, they took out the best friends. Well, they took out Trent already. 
So he won't be there to interrupt the wedding, apparently, or he, he wouldn't be there to interrupt their announcement. Um, we didn't get to see the attack, which, of course, is a visual medium. We need to see the attack. Now, a lot of people have said that, you know, Trent was injured and that he needs to have surgery. That's why they kind of writing him off TV. OK, um, but we still could have seen the attack. You know, we still could have seen Miro break these guys. Down. Like why? This was a, a clear opportunity to get Miro over. Like the guy needs to have surgery anyway, like sur surgery for like a shoot. Oh, sweet. Even better. You could have just had. You know, Trent already on the ground and then watch Miro beat up, you know, Orange Cassidy and uh, the other guy. Naturally, we would have assumed that Miro all, already handled the Trent problem and Trent's on the ground selling his shoulder like, oh, oh, as he's tossing Chuck Taylor and Orange Cassidy around. You know, that would have been dope because we still would have got the visual, but we wouldn't have had to actually put hands on Trent, you know. So he could have just been on the ground selling and then, you know, Miro could have literally been laying waste to Chuck Taylor and Orange Cassidy just to get over that This guy's a monster. Instead of just saying people are asking, like, what's wrong with you? What happened? It's like, what the fuck? Come on, bro. So the, the, the wedding will be at Beach Break, which I guess is another uh, AEW themed event. They will have numerous themed events. Because they're having a New Year's smash for two weeks. And now they're going to have beach break in February. So it's going to be February the 3rd. As if anyone cares. So then Dustin Rose, Russell Evil Uno. That's a hell of a card they, they've put together here. Dustin Rose versus Evil Uno of the Dark Order. So they told the story of Seven. Uh, well, Tony Schiavone told the story that on TNT, Dustin was given the character Seven. It basically says, like, oh, yeah, you know, wrestling is, is, is nothing but gimmicks. That's Vince Russo stuff right there, dog. And that's one of the things about Vince Russo I've always hated is that he insists on using people's real names and giving people gimmicks and then using their gimmick name and the real name at the same time. That was so frustrating. All they had to do was say that, you know, look, I, I'm, I, I'm OK with them addressing the gimmick about why this specific number bothers Dustin and why this specifically bothered Dustin. I'm just talking about in general. In the, in the context of this story, it makes sense. But in in general, I, I don't like the idea of just talking about like the gimmick, the character of. It's like you shouldn't be talking about that. You're supposed to be it's like you're in this world. You know, like you're in this world. You could have just said that, you know, Dustin went through a tough time where he was started calling himself seven. And he was doing all of these weird things and then he snapped out of it or, you know, somebody grabbed him and snapped him out of it. He was going through a tough time in his life with this seven thing. You know, you didn't have to say, well, and on TNT, he was given the character seven. Because it's like, did TNT give him the character Evil Uno? Like, what? Oh, what? <laughs> uh, OK. Look, man, I don't know shit. All right. But I will say this. I was very excited about something I saw today. I was very excited about something I saw. So I was excited about two things. One, I got a bulldog finish. Dustin won with a bulldog. I did not care about this match at all because I, I, I really didn't care. I really didn't care at all. Um, so I got to see a bulldog, which I love bulldogs, especially since I talked just recently about how much I love bulldogs. And Dustin's bulldog is really good. And he, he beat him with the bulldog. But the second thing is that we got somebody getting saved. We got the basics. They, they brought the basics back. I'm, I'm too excited about this. So Evil Uno, after losing, is down on his knees. He's still trying to recruit Dustin. Dustin, being a baby face for some reason, decided to keep beating up Evil Uno. The guy who was on his knees, he kicked him in the face or something like that, beat him up. Stu Grayson comes out and beat up Dustin. So Stu Grayson, the heel, came out to help the heel. Smart decision. Stu Grayson is laying waste to Dustin. Here comes QT Marshall or QT Marshall. And he tries to save Dustin and gets knocked the fuck out. He gets knocked out. He got dropped. So then here comes Lee Johnson, who is like 22, and he runs off the Dark Order. And I was like, cool. Fucking cool. Okay. I like that. You gave the the big shine 
to the young kid who came in to save his mentors. I like that. It thumbs up. Top marks. Question though. Why is the Dark Order heels right here in their baby faces last week? Why? Why is it that half the Dark Order are baby faces and the other half are heels? Why is that? Can somebody explain to me why Evil Uno is cool with Alex Reynolds and John Silver acting like fucking goofs? Where is Brody Lee? Why is nobody mentioning this fracturing of the Dark Order? Like, it's been... It's not like they built up this fracture and then it just kind of happened. You know, like, it's not like, you know, NWO and NWO Wolfpack. You know, <laughs> like, like the leaders are arguing and then somebody says, I'm going to take my version of the Dark Order and we're going this way. Evil Uno, you take your Dark Order and you go that way. You know, and, you know, maybe we'll see each other at Thanksgiving or something like that. You know, <laughs> maybe that wasn't that didn't feel like the case here. It just felt like, oh, we didn't know what else to do. John Silver, he's just going to, again, r ride Hangman Page like a hobby horse. He was not on the show, by the way. There was no Hangman Page tonight. So then uh, I was so excited about them saves. And I knew I was too excited about saves. I was like, yes. They're, they're I mean, look at, they, they got Lee Johnson owning the ring. He's owning the ring. He's in the ring. Like, yeah, come get some. And I'm like, yeah, go get it. Yeah, I like this. And then Sean Spears appears. Sean Spears. Sean Spears. Talking about how he left New York because the grass ain't always but the grass ain't always greener. That this the, the the glass ceiling is the same no matter where he goes. And he's better than everyone. But because his hand picked uh Tony Khan's hand picked E V P pushed him into a hole. And, you know, and Tony Schiavone said, well, maybe you're the problem. You're the common denominator here. You're the problem. So Sean Spears says, well, you're a piece of shit for saying that. Why would you say something like that? And then said that he'll come back if he feels like it. So apparently he's leaving. Can't leave fast enough for me. This is segment or push number five or six or seven or eight for Sean Spears, man. This is a car that just won't start. This is a car that will not start. No matter how many times you put the keys in the ignition and you try to turn it over, it's just not going to work. This shit sucks. He fucking sucks. Okay, let's just face it. Face facts. He sucks. Leave it alone, dog. Leave it alone. It's time to just very quietly move him over to trainer. Or very, very quietly drop anything that has something to do. Like what happened to him and Tully? Nothing. What happened to him with the black glove? Nothing. Him being the chairman of AEW? Nothing. Him being the, the killer of AEW Dark? Nothing. All of this stuff, it never leads anywhere. Fucking Sean Spears sucks. What happened to his tag team partner? He's supposed to have a tag team partner. That dropped. This sucks. Sean Spears does not have it. Stop trying to force the issue. He does not have it just because he was over. And this is the very, the very, man, it's kind of strange, right? Like you're told, oh, well, this guy's over. He's a star, you know, because people are chanting 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. It's like, then why nobody chanting for him today? If he was so over, why is nobody chanting for that motherfucker today? People pretended that they liked him. You know, at what, what, what show was that? All In, all, all Out, whatever that was. When he wrestled Cody. People pretended that they really liked that match. That match was boring as shit. That's why nobody talks about it. It sunk everything. Cody quietly moved on. Just completely Heisman, not Heisman, but yeah, Heisman tro trophy this feud and went on to doing something else. Sean Spears fucking sucks. Sean Spears sucks. Okay, so uh, after that, we get Hikaru Shida. She was about to cut a promo on Abaddon. And then Abaddon came out of nowhere and punched her in the face. And they scrapped for a little bit. Then they got broken up. Then um, Hikaru Shida had a match. She had to have a match with Alex Gracia. I thought it was Garcia, but it's Gracia. And I saw her on Twitter. They call her the Pink Dream. She's kind of thick. You know, she's, you know, I don't, I've never seen her before. But she seemed to move very well. Like she's, you know, experienced. Like she knew what she was doing, you know? So it was okay. 
you know, they, I like that they traded some drop kicks. So it was pretty cool. Um, but, you know, the match gets weird when Abaddon is out in the crowd as uh, Hikaru Shida is outside the ring. Abaddon is in the crowd. She kind of sits up like, uh, you know, like one of them, uh, like one of the monsters from um, Super Mario that's in the tunnel. Like, whoa, <laughs> so she kind of comes up and uh, Hikaru Shida is not scared of her anymore. So she goes over there to get her some. Hikaru Shida pulls her over the barricade, beats Abaddon, and slams her head into the metal barricade, which was pretty good. I was like, okay, I like that. Only problem is she was outside the ring for like a 40 count. And then, like, the, the referee's like, six, seven. I'm like, what? <laughs> you should have been counted out. Um, she gets back in the ring, finishes the match. She actually wins with the Falcon Arrow. So Alice Gracia, AEW Dynamite uh, debut, and she's supposed to like a big deal on the Indies, and she lost and didn't get and got a job or entrance at that. So then Hikaru Shida picks up her uh, her kendo stick, her ever trusty kendo stick, and she goes to see what's up with this. Uh, she goes back to Abaddon. She kind of pokes Abaddon with this stick, like you know, you know, kind of like you poke a dead body. Abaddon snaps up. Grabs the stick and kind of yanks it. They get into a little fight, get into a scuffle, and then somehow, some way, Abaddon bites Hikaru Shida on the neck. Bite, bite, bite. And it was basically like she was a zombie. You know, she bites people. And I was like, all right. You know what? I'm not mad. I like the biting angle. I know a lot of people kind of groaned at it. You know, a lot of the wrestling journalists, they kind of groaned at it. It was like, oh, you know, I can't, why are they biting people? Why are they doing this in the pandemic? I was just kind of like, she's a monster. She does monster stuff. Monsters bite people sometimes, dog. I mean, they do. I mean, what, what what can you do? Monsters bite people sometimes, dog. You know, I'm okay with it. It's vicious. It's violent. The only problem, I, I, I mean, what, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with it. Other than the unrealistic nature of, you know, are you going to, you know, bite a whole piece of Hikaru Shida's neck. I'm like, no, you're not, you know. But just like, you know, when you, you know, there's a lot of things in wrestling that are very, very unrealistic that people just seem to be okay with. And, of course, this, you know, brought up a lot of talk about Shayna Baszler biting Becky Lynch. Speaking of which, do you remember that, that whole Becky Lynch and Shayna Baszler thing and David Meltzer talking about, oh, they're going to give Shayna Baszler a vampire gimmick. Because she bit somebody. I guess Mike Tyson had a vampire gimmick too. <laughs> because he talked about eating <laughs> Lennox Lewis's children and he bit <laughs> Holyfield. So I guess he had a vampire gimmick. Like, come on, man. People bite each other in real life. Like, so what? And wrestlers bite each other all the time. You can go watch uh, like different wrestlers, the 70s, 80s. They bite each other all the time. Biting is a part of wrestling, man. You know, it's, it just is. But, you know, the cartoonish amount of blood and, you know, stuff like that, maybe. Maybe that's a little too much. But, you know, acting like, you know, biting is some, some new thing. It's like people bite all the time. It's part of fighting. If you want to fight, you know, there are no rules, dog. You might get bit. It might happen to you. So the main event was uh she not um uh, Sheeta um the acclaimed and the young bucks um I already shit on the acclaimed I don't like them I don't like this rap shit that they're doing um I don't like this match because again it was more young bucks just doing stuff they did a doomsday device in the middle of the match just broke out a doomsday device just cool move just broke it out like boom doomsday device you know cool move cool move bro cool move. Of course, uh, the Young Bucks win because every match on this show was you know, a foregone conclusion. There was no question of who was going to win any of these matches. None. So, to me, in ring, it was boring. Um, Storylines didn't really progress either because you really gave the acclaim. You're trying to give the acclaim some heat, but they're not, they haven't been individualized. We don't know who these people are. We don't know what their background is. We don't know why they rap. We don't know who they are. We just know that they're the rapper guys. And then you give them a main event, like their second or third week on TV. Then they lose. 
And then people just say like, oh, they did a great job. It was a great showing. It's like they didn't do anything. They just absorbed moves. Like you didn't get a personality from these guys. You didn't get anything individual from these guys. That's what you should be looking for in characters. You should be looking for the individual imprint of these performers. You're not getting that. Because and people are just like ensconced in the idea that they're putting their young guys in there with Chris Jericho. Oh, I can't believe this is so much better than being in developmental in the performance center. It's like, oh boy. <laughs> I just like, man, these people got that shit. That got that competition shit on the brain. Like, I sometimes I do that, too. I talk about, like, you know, imagine if it was Stanford. Because I'm talking about them being hypocrites, not comparing the systems. I don't give a shit. You know, Jericho can wrestle as many 21-year-olds as he wants. The the point, the reason Chris Jericho is wrestling the 21-year-olds is the same reason Tommaso Ciampa would be wrestling them. How the hell else did you get better? You have to wrestle people who are better than you. But the question is, what are they going to learn if you're just going to let them do what they do? You know, that's it's like if they're just going to be basically the young bucks in dark skin, that's that's not an identity. That's not nothing new. We need something fresh and new from these guys. You know, we need, you know, now the, the acclaimed is kind of new. It's kind of fresh. It's a rapper gimmick, but. You know, and they actually have a gimmick unlike Top Flight. Top Flight doesn't even have a gimmick. Their gimmick is that they do flips. But they haven't sat down and decided, okay, what what is what is the look? What generation are we going for here? What is, you know, our stuff? Like, they, they assume everybody watches Dark, right? They assume, like, oh, these guys won matches all the time. They have a great record on Dark. It's like nobody watches Dark. I certainly don't watch it. Don't assume that I watch it. Don't assume that I watch Dark. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was silly. But I didn't I didn't like the main event. It was a foregone conclusion. They could it could have had it could have had that match first, if for all I care. You know, I don't know what the main event would have been then. Cause looking at this card, the main event was shit. The show was shit. You know, and if you and if you think I'm just a hater, let's go through the card one more time. The Young Bucks versus the Acclaimed was the main event. Hikaru Shida versus Alex Gracia. Dustin Rhodes versus Evil Uno. Uh, the Butcher versus Pac. Six Man Tag Jurassic Express versus The Dark Order. Uh, and Chris Jericho and MJF versus Top Flight. That was, that's the card from top to bottom. Plus Sting, plus Jay Cargill promos, plus FTR promos. So they did some good promo stuff. Some of the promo stuff was good. I like the, the Jericho promo and the MJF stuff. I like some of the promos. Some of the promos were good where they individualized some characters, you know, made, let some guys stand out. But the match is not, bro. bro. And, they was, and they were long. They weren't short. They weren't short and meaningless. They were long and meaningless, you know, and they didn't seem to really further that much of anything. But that's me. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Um, like this video, share this video, subscribe to the channel, tell other people about the channel. Word of mouth really spreads out. It really helps. You know, I would appreciate that if you could sp help spread the good word of three count commentaries. Hit the hashtag. Just drop the hashtag somewhere on, you know, on somebody else's shit. <laughs> I'm going I'm to I'm turn myself into a virus. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go into people's comment sections and be like, hey, hashtag. If you click it, then my video will show up. That would be great. That would be great. So if you if you can't share it and get to anybody to watch it, then just hit the drop the hashtag, three count commentaries, somewhere where, you know, hopefully a lot of people will, will be able to click it and find the channel. I would really appreciate that. That's the least you could do. I would appreciate that very, very much. I also appreciate money. If you just say, hey, here's money, shut up. Okay, great. I'll, I'll do that. I'll take the money and be quiet and stick with 339 subscribers, which I all appreciate. I appreciate everybody, even though I'm kind of, I'm still kind of trying to, I'm trying to figure out how I got this far because, <laughs> you know, usually sometimes people blow up and they'd be like, oh, I, I never, I never thought about it. Like, I didn't think anybody was listening to me at first, you know, 
And then it kind of blew up out of nowhere. Just like a lot of people started listening. But so thank you guys. You know, I appreciate it. Even if I don't get a another subscriber, I still appreciate it. Um, everybody who do take time to listen to these videos while you at work, while you, you know, at the gym or something like that to try to deliver some type of uh, insightful and informative wrestling commentary that might be a little bit biased, but at least I'm going to admit that I'm biased and things that I hate. Like I, I hate these bootleg rappers. I don't like that. I don't like the flippy shit either. I don't like the flippy shit anywhere. So to be quite honest, like some people don't like that, you know, the fiends were set on fire. I don't like that people do flips. I'm just, to me, it's, it's, it's stupid. You know, like it's stupid. You don't fight in flips. I'll set somebody on fire in a fight. I ain't never flipped in a fight. I ain't never, I've been in plenty of fights. I ain't, I ain't never seen nobody do a flip. Not on purpose. And they, <laughs> not on purpose. But uh, thank you guys for listening. Um, again, like, subscribe, share the channel. Go out there, spread the good word of three count commentary. Join my street team. And thank you guys for listening. And I'll talk to you guys later.